Cool. All right, five minutes. All right, guys. So I am. I'm Jason Newsom, and I'm a very early career developer. Um, honestly, I'm speaking to a bunch of individuals that are a lot smarter than me, but uh, this is out of my comfort zone, so there's nothing cool about that. Um, I just want to share my experience about how I started contributing um, to any open source project, the, the actual 200 OK website. Uh, my, the biggest hurdle I biggest hurdle I faced uh, was just figuring out where to start and just being really intimidated about doing any kind of like pull requests and just trying to contribute in any way. Um, and I think the best way to start is really just trying to build, find a community, right? Like Techlahoma, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for this organization. Um, and it really helped me kind of get over the initial stages of like my uh, imposter syndrome. I still, I don't know why I'm up here, but <laughs> uh, I just want to share that, hey, anyone can do this. Uh, I started learning four months ago. And even just like, uh, So, uh, <laughs> thanks, y'all. Um, so finding the community and then just reaching out, putting yourself out there, and just figuring out, like, hey, uh, guys, like, what can I do to help? And um, things came up, like uh, Oglathon. You, you get assigned. Okay, I'm losing my mind. I'm sorry. You do good. Um. Well, anywho, okay. So I was able to learn uh, to work and practice my uh, basic web dev skills um, on the 200OK website, thanks to Travis and, uh, and Max. Woo! They gave me the freedom to tackle like the smallest things, like uh, adding parking information on the website today, if you happen to use that. Um, thanks, Emily, for giving us information, and I added it to the website for y'all. Um, or like adding the ticket sales widgets, um, uh, just updating just basic information. Um, but in doing so, it gave me you know, uh, the knowledge to how to use Git, uh, GitHub, Git CLIs, um, communicating with them and coordinating to make sure I'm not uh, doing duplicate work and uh, making it worse for everyone. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, uh, important things to learn from using Git was just to make sure to create separate branches, ideally for each issue, um, just checking and pulling. and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm freezing. I'm sorry, y'all. This is hard. Um, but then with that, like, also, like, the biggest thing I learned was that, yeah, anyone can do this. You guys are obviously supporting me and doing this, so thank you very much. Um, it is intimidating, but it's really nice to know that we have such a really great network of people that are willing to support us in our journeys. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Way to step up our level for the rest of our speakers so we'll actually learn something cool. All right, everyone give it up for Cody. Here we go. Hello, everybody. My name is Cody. Um, this, this presentation I just put together today is called I'm Actually Automating Awesomeness, and my work did not approve or endorse this. Uh, other names I considered for this were I'm not 200 okay or DX out for LLMBE. So those were options I considered. Uh, who the flip are you? Who am I? Well, I'll tell you what I am. I am not a developer. I actually, uh, a year ago, uh, or currently my title is uh, I'm a product manager, but now I'm a prompt engineer. So this is what my uh, GitHub contributions looked like a year ago, and then GPT-4 came out, and then I became a genius and very poor at the same time. So the first thing I did was I had looked at code before, and I'd always wanted to do it, but like there was this getting started problem that I had. Um, I am a very weather anxious person, so I built a weather app. I built an app that could look at the APIs from the National Weather Service, turn those into Mastodon alerts so I could get push notifications without going to that terrible place that has a, had a bird logo. And now that's, I have, and I just like, continue to work on this. But then my ADHD brain said more. So then I made this weird alien language conversion thing because I went to Meow Wolf in Denver and it was very cool and very fun. So I just wanted to keep going and my brain said more. And so then I made this, uh, what would we call this? This is like a scavenger hunt inside the GitWit office using NFC tags. I just kept asking for prompts and like kept asking the LM to build stuff for me and it kept doing it really well. 
But I learned that there's things that you still have to do even when you're doing code that are really annoying. And I kept thinking, I can just automate that step. And that is not true. How long I think it takes to automate something and how long it takes to actually do it, man, I am real bad at estimating how long it's gonna take to automate that until ChatGPT came out. So I'm gonna show you today how you can turn technical debt. <laughs> hey, I, I, Creative Commons, I, it's okay. Into technical profit. All right, so the first one I'm gonna show you is I taught the AI how to clean my room. Not really. So who has ever had a CSV worth, you know, with garbage data in it, right? So you see like, okay, well they capitalized these words and that, like I needed to be consistent. Hey chat, can you write a Python script that uses the API to just send each individual cell of this CSV through a prompt and then turns that into something that's properly capitalized? Well, yeah, yeah, it'll do that. Here's what the code it wrote. And this is what it did. You see it turned like John Doe into actually formatted thing. The word teacher was misspelled. It fixed that. I didn't tell it to do spell check. It just understood the assignment. So I said, do my homework. Not really. You know, I, oh, I guess I forgot to put the other slide in here. I, I had a new database of like with empty rows and I just created it, but I need some sample data in there. So I just took a screenshot of the literal empty database in Supabase and I said, can you just fill this in? So he goes, here you go. I said, oh, I like movie and TV and video game references. Cool, here's uh, Stark Industries, Umbrella Corporation, Vault Tech. I literally just said, here's a screenshot of my database, create sample entries. With the weather stuff, I said, hey, here's six weather maps. Can you, you know, other, other than like, you be safe, Ooh, okay. But can, you, can you tell me what this says I should do? Or yeah, the National Weather Service indicates a high probability of thunderstorms. Cool. You can send very unfinished work to the LLM and it will fill it in for you. I also wanna show you something I'm kind of getting more reps with, local AI. You can call it incognito mode if you want. I don't need it for that. But why should you use a local AI? Well, let's ask the local AI to tell us. Well, one, it's local. You can use it without the internet. That's pretty great. Last night I was using AI without the internet at a weird competition. It's very helpful. It's not more accurate, I have to dispute that point, um, but it is less expensive. So yesterday I had a folder full of memes that just need, badly needed re renamed. So I had GPT make me a script to send every single meme to OpenAI, determine what it was, and then come up with a new file name for that meme. That cost about eight bucks. That's a lot, you know? So if you wanna do some stuff really cheap, local AI is a way to do it. And jam.ai is this app I used. It'll help you manage downloading and doing everything. It was very good. So finally, emotional undamage. If you're feeling really bad about yourself, you can tell GPT this. I call the GPT Jeep. I say, hey Jeep, I'm struggling. What do I do? And it's like, it's okay to feel this way. So if you ever like, feel like you need someone to talk to, it's there for you. Uh, bonus, uh, if you give it very specific instructions, it's very good at that. So I said, use Tailwind, build me a MySpace page for Chester the Cheetah. And I got this. So if you're very specific about what you want it to do, it can, it can do that quite well, but you have to be specific. All right, well, that's me. Uh, my work, I said I, they did not look at this or approve this, but thank you for letting me yell at you. <laughs>
specifically, why should you be using Docker if you are not deploying, if you're not ops, you're just doing local dev, you've got RBM installed, you're, you're kind of like doing your thing, why should you still care? Uh, there's a couple of good reasons. Uh, a lot of this is going to come down to it works on my machine. Uh, but first one is faster code reviews. If you have, even if it's like a composed file for your repo that you're working on, if you're having a problem and you want to email uh, a dev and say like, hey, can you take a look at this? You're not dealing with any, well, what's your setup look like? What environment variables do you have? Stuff like that. Uh, so that's very, very nice to be able to collaborate. Very, very nice tool. Um, you're going to have fewer surprises as you're pushing. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, you're going to have fewer surprises as you are pushing up to GitHub, GitLab uh, with your CI CD pipeline. Uh, if you take a look at those, they're just Docker under the hood. And uh, if you have your tests set up to look like your CI pipelines, then you can kind of catch errors locally before you push up and you look very smart and very clever. Um, you have way better relationships with ops teams. If you were at a big company where you write the code and then you kind of bring that bag of code to ops and say like, please put this in prod for me, they're gonna like you a lot better if your stuff is already in Docker because uh, the ops people have to take your code, figure out what to feed it, figure out what environment variables it needs, what it looks like actually in prod. And even just a compose file makes that way, way, way easier. Uh, if for some reason you are uh, running like a local Kubernetes cluster, you will get weird bonus points and you'll get invited to all their parties. Um, finally, uh, Docker networks are really, really nice. If you are developing on a couple of applications that are connected to each other, that talk to another, well, let's say you want to do it on an airplane for some reason and you don't want to pay for the Wi-Fi, you can have those stacks up separately. You can have them talk to each other. You don't need to be necessarily making calls to um, some like non-prod network in order to get work done. Um, there are, of course, friction points. Uh, doing development in a container is still kind of squinchy depending on what editor you use. Um, and you, you may not always get squiggly lines if you're doing it just in Docker. So this is like Docker and your local dev environment. Um, it can be a little bit heavier than local dev because you are oftentimes like if I, you know, I run windows and so you have WSL sitting there taking up space. Um, and then depending on the architecture of the laptop you're using, you may not have a Docker image for, um, for your architecture, but as a rule, if you are just starting to, to play with a project or if you have something existing, highly, highly recommend uh, spitting out a compose file. ChatGPT can do that very, very well. Um, and just seeing what that gets you. Fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Check, check. Nailed it. <laughs> Perfect. All right, you just tell me. So this is part of the slideshow? You say uh, next, you say next slide. Okay, yeah, I'll just say. Uh, so yeah, we are mainly going to be talking about Andrew Tarvin. He did a, um, all I can think of is live coding. It's not a live coding. He did a TED talk. Um, and it was adopting, or, and it was about humor at work, humor in the workplace. You can go to the next one. He said just because something is efficient doesn't mean it's effective. And just because it saves time doesn't mean it actually gets us results. Next one. He advocates for using humor in the workplace to make your job more fun. He says that people who use humor at work are more productive, less stressed, paid more, and happier, according to all these things that I probably trust. 83% of Americans feel stressed out at work. 55% of Americans feel unsatisfied with their job, and 47% of Americans struggle to stay happy. He states that using humor increases long-term memory retention, improves understanding, aids in learning, improves group cohesiveness, brings people closer together, reduces employee absenteeism, and prevents long-term burnout. So let's talk about Andrew's story himself. He was nearing the end of his um, internship at PNG, and he had to give a presentation, and a job was on the line. Whoever gave the best presentation got the job. 
right? He said this presentation was killer because it was going to bore them to death. So the night before, he rewrote the entire presentation using MS Paint. And he got the job. They loved it. Next one. Oh. This would have been more impactful if I had a clicker, but it's fine. Uh, it's... Max, you're doing great. Am I? Yeah. Am I? Uh, okay, I already read that sentence, so you can, yeah. So I did the same thing. As my time at Holberton, I was a um, student tutor here, and I was able to give um, chats to everyone. I was going, able to give live codings over professional topics and code topics. I did this for Malik and Free, which are to see functions and things, right? Another one in that same thing was a brief intro to Valgrind, right? Incredible puns. I was so proud of that pun. And I got two and a half people to laugh just now. It's, it's great. Still paying off. This next one. Now, the thing about being humorous at work is that you still have to be functional. You still have to actually be telling people what you want to tell them. So in this case, I was teaching recursion to a bunch of the lower students that were still in their first couple of trimesters. And I have this meme. How did you get like that? Every time I do a push-up, I do one push-up. He said, Jesus Christ, right? Well, I coded that. I live coded that on stage. I made something called do one push-up. And I created this and I let it output and it did 261,751 push-ups before it seg faulted. Right. People loved it. Another thing I did was, as I said, I did some professional development things. Uh, things like how to have an effective peer learning day, which is a day where we all come together and learn about topics. Um, it was like these first things, ask a question, take the wheel. I love my little uh, poop bullets, that's great. Um, another one, this is your, like yours, no, 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 go back, go back. <laughs> this is your, um, your like second, the second thing you try to do. Is write something blatantly incorrect or controversial on the board. Got that idea from Buzz. People love being right. People love correcting you, so it's great. And then the last one, instead of saying um, your last resort, I said, cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. Yeah. Anyway, anyone, you know, a lot of people know that. Um, ask an instructor and blah, blah, blah. Just simple things. Next one. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Your scroll time is subtracted from my presentation time. Um, this presentation was on how to give a good presentation. And I started with a very bad presentation and I slowly fixed it over time. So when I came out on the stage, obviously random picture, I don't know who these people are. Presenting a good presentation is very useful for people. And I, I acted that out. I made it fun. Next one. I showed why it is terrible. Next one. I showed an improved version of it. Next slide. And I showed why it was improved, right? So I'm using these humorous things, things that make people laugh, to actually convey an important uh, topic. Next. And then this is the most recent one that I did. I actually did this a while ago. Um, I was practicing UI design, and I had to make a product card. So I came up with a fictional hot dog restaurant called Girthy Glizzies, because, you know, like, <sighs> They're not very long, but man, they have girth, right? Super appropriate and fantastic, but I made a really freaking good product card, right? And I got so many compliments on that. Not only was it funny and it grabbed people's attention because it's funny, it was effective because I did it well. Next. That's all I got. Thanks for listening. You can connect with me on that one, and uh, you can watch Andrew Tarvin's TED Talk on that. This little grayed out hire me, please, was supposed to be like rotating and everything. So, you know, if you want to hire me, that would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's been great talking to you. Do we have any questions? There's a real question. Okay. 
So what if you're just not funny? Um, <laughs> So Andrew Tarvin actually talks about this. You don't have to be naturally funny to do funny things and share funny things. So even if you can't come up with funny things yourself, simply sharing memes with people in your office is perfect. You know, people enjoy working with people who show them memes. I mean, you know, and if they don't, you don't want to work there. <laughs> I, I can... I can link you to some more things that Andrew Tarvin wrote about that. But yeah, anything else? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks,